Additional Navy films of the battle for Iwo Jima. Marine divisions eliminate positions on Mount Suribachi, first target on Iwo's southern tip. Here, at least 115 Jap defensive emplacements confronted our troops as they battled their way up from the landing beaches. Additional waves arrived. Elements of the 3rd Marine Division reinforced the 4th and 5th Marines already in action on EO. Advances are slowed up to gains of a few yards a day by the intense mortar, rocket and machine gun fire and the widespread minefields which the Marines encounter. Unloading of supplies goes forward in the face of harassing fire and volcanic sands which retard the progress of rolling stock. Tanks are used in support of troops attacking the island's airfields. The first prisoners are brought aboard one of our ships lying off EO. Up to 26 February, nearly 5,000 enemy dead were counted. Only 10 Japanese had been taken prisoner. Marines on the island, there's no slackening in enemy resistance. Landing craft bring in tank reserves. From his camera position inside one of the tanks, a Marine combat photographer records the action around Mount Suribachi. Advanced units scaling the cliffs are often pinned down by grenades and demolition charges dropped on them by Japs entrenched in caves and pillboxes. Consolidate small gains made up the face of the volcanic cone. Flames flush Japs out of dug-in positions. A routed Jap seeks new cover and is exposed to our gunfire. The capture of Suribachi removes one of the major obstacles to envelopment of the island's northern section. Radio Luxembourg, operated by the Army's Psychological Warfare Division to help break down German morale and induce Nazi troops to surrender. Rated at 150,000 watts, it's the most powerful long-wave station in Europe. Radio Luxembourg is on the air up to 24 hours a day and can reach even those receivers inside the Reich intended by Nazi propagandists to exclude all but German wavelengths. The station was captured when we entered Luxembourg City last year. Today it relays programs from the OWI station in London, from BBC, and from American outlets. In the Radio Luxembourg newsroom, Army intelligence and other military sources provide material for the studio's specially prepared German language broadcasts. The daily programs include revelations of scandal and corruption inside Germany, excerpts from unmailed letters found on German soldiers, recordings in which German prisoners of war tell how well they're treated by the Allies. It also sends information to Frenchmen, Poles and Czechs at forced labor inside Germany instructing them in methods for slowing down Nazi production and how otherwise to aid the Allied cause. Demonstrating the Panzerfaust at Gürznich, Germany. The recoilless anti-tank launcher is the Nazi equivalent of the American bazooka. The First Army plans to use captured Panzerfausts and instructs 8th Division infantry troops in their employment. The Seine River port of Rouen is handling its greatest tonnage as vast cargoes arrive for the Allied armies at the Rhine. Under the Marine Division of the Army Transportation Corps, systematic control is exercised over Liberty and Victory ships and coasters which daily sail in and out of the port.
Prominent among France's great ports in pre-war tonnage, Rouen was almost completely destroyed before it fell to the Allies last summer. The rapid rehabilitation was the combined work of the Allied navies, the Army engineers, and the French civilian authorities. The port commenced full-scale operations in the fall. The first ship discharged 529 tons. 20,000 more tons were handled in the next 15 days, and the figure has mounted to many times that total. Ordnance outfits at Rouen prepare newly arrived tanks and vehicles for delivery to the Western Front. Transporting the equipment to the battle lines is expedited by an express trucking route running eastward beyond Paris. Construction of bridges in this area necessitated construction of an unusually large bailey for two-way traffic. Mud bogs down whole convoys near the front. Supply routes beyond the main highways and leading directly to the firing lines are impassable as the result of melting snows. Near Saint-Vite, a week of rain has further interfered with normal traffic. To meet this transportation emergency, the Allied command calls for airdrops of vital replacements. Panels are laid at Blyauf, Germany, south of Saint-Viet, to guide in the C-47s of the Troop Carrier Command. The first planes to arrive from England parachute a Pathfinder group, specially trained to direct aerial supply trains. Paratroopers are equipped with radio facilities and quickly contact the cargo craft. In mid-February, a total of 75 C-47s come over the 4th Division sector in two waves. They drop supplies, including gas, rations, and ammunition for weapons under 105 mm. Colored smoke grenades also are utilized as drop zone markers and wind direction indicators. In the drops, a few gasoline drums break when they hit the ground and start small fires. However, the majority of the airborne material lands in good condition. Elements of the 571st Quartermaster Railhead Battalion gather the supplies for delivery to the troops. Airborne delivery near the front alleviates the critical truck transport problem resulting from rain and thaw. These supplies arrive as new drives are being initiated against the river barriers before the Reich. On an American cruiser in Great Bitter Lake, midway along the Suez Canal, President Roosevelt awaits to receive three Middle Eastern rulers. The first of the distinguished visitors to arrive is King Farouk of Egypt. Accompanied by Admiral Leahy and other members of his party, he greets the president and meets Anna Bodiger, the president's daughter. In the conversations that followed, President Roosevelt and the king talked over many questions affecting Egyptian-American relationships. The president stressed the importance of expanding trade relations and discussed the post-war position of American air bases in Egypt. His cordial meeting with the president over, King Farouk leaves. Later the same afternoon, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, arrives at the president's headquarters. He's accompanied by J.K. Caldwell, the American minister accredited to him, and several dignitaries. In his talk with the emperor, the president spoke in favor of improved communications between Ethiopia and the United States, particularly by air. The emperor enthusiastically endorsed the president's wish for closer relations between the two countries. 
On the day following the president's reception of King Farouk and Emperor Haile Selassie, a United States destroyer draws up beside the presidential cruiser, bringing King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. The destroyer is especially decorated for the occasion with thick carpets spread on the foredeck and a royal tent sent up under the guns of the forward turret. King Ibn Saud is accompanied by Colonel William A. Eddy, Marine Corps retired, American minister to Saudi Arabia. The discussions between the monarch and the American president centered on economic relationships between Saudi Arabia and the United States. The American oil concerns have concessions which the government of Saudi Arabia has granted them. Members of the King's party inspect the cruiser. King Ibn Saud returns to the waiting destroyer. The president's meeting with the Arabian ruler is expected to do much to clarify Middle East problems and to make for better relations between the Arab world and the Western nations. Men of the 738th Ordnance Company demonstrate assembly of a 120 millimeter Jap mortar captured by troops of the 152nd Infantry. This is the first Jap mortar of its size and type ever taken. The three sections of the mortar, barrel, base plate and tripod are quickly set up for firing. showing the operation of the elevation and traverse mechanisms. The firing mechanism is typical of Japanese mortars. Each case holds two 120 millimeter shells. The powder dish ring is placed on the shell neck and the nose fuse made ready for insertion. Army nurses liberated after three years internment in the Santa Toma prison camp at Manila stand at attention as they are awarded the Bronze Star and a one-rank promotion by Brigadier General Donut, Chief Surgeon, Southwest Pacific Area. The ceremonies took place near Tacloban Airstrip, Leyte. Lieutenant Colonel Forrester, Chief Nurse, Southwest Pacific Area, assists Brigadier General Donut in presenting the Bronze Star and pinning on the new rank insignia. The nurses arrive at the airstrip where two C-54s of the Air Transport Command are ready to fly them back to the United States. The nurses were captured when Bataan fell to the Japanese. They are the first of the liberated Santa Toma internees to be returned to their homes. Cavite Naval Base marked by smashed oil storage tanks and huge bomb craters. The Kanokawa Sangley section of the base is shown wrecked by American bombers and Jap demolition previous to its capture by troops of the 11th Airborne Division. The Marine Railways. The Navy Hospital. This causeway between the Navy Yard and the city of Cavite was demolished by the retreating Japs. A pump house wrecked by the Japs at Machina Wharf. Cavite, located on a point of land eight miles southwest of Manila, was the former United States Naval headquarters in the Philippines. Boiler parts for the USS Trinity, an American ship under repair when the Japs seized the area in 1942. Manila, a city in ruins devastated by fire, shelling and demolition. Roads and fields are strewn with new type Jap mines. House-to-house -house fighting in the Armita district. 
Mortar observers direct fire on Jap positions as infantry and tanks advance against Intramuros, the old Spanish walled city. Thirty-seven millimeter anti-tank guns provide covering fire for tanks and infantry. Flamethrowers burn out Jap pillboxes. Heavy fighting at Harrison Park and Rizal Stadium, Southern Manila. Troops of the Second Squadron, Fifth Cavalry, First Cavalry Division dismounted, and units of a tank battalion close in on the last organized Jap resistance in this section of the city. Battle of the Ballpark. Infantry and tanks move across a manila ballpark against Japs in the stands and dugouts. The Japs, estimated to number over a hundred, were equipped with machine guns and knee mortars. Frontal attack proving too costly, troops attempt to outflank the enemy. in to wipe out the last remaining Japs in the ballpark. Artillery of the 136th Field Artillery Battalion, 37th Division, opens fire on Jap positions across the Pasig River. Public buildings are fortified by last-ditch Jap defenders. American artillery demolishes a large ice plant. For three days, the Japs had used the ice house as a storage depot, shelter, and base for sniping. A cannon company of the 145th Infantry set the building ablaze with 105 millimeter shells and leveled it in one hour. Finding the range on the walls of Intramuros, which are about 500 yards from our gun positions. Some of the walls are 40 feet thick. The YMCA building is destroyed by artillery fire. Jap troops observed in one of the archways of the walled city. Later, these archways were destroyed by our 105 millimeter shells. Japs, driven from their positions by concentrated artillery fire, dash for safety across an open plaza. On 15th February, units of the 7th Fleet open up a 90-minute barrage on the southern tip of Bataan in preparation for landing elements of the 38th Division at Marivelas Harbor. Each hour is at 1000. The first wave, consisting of a single regiment, moves toward the head of the beach. While the Higgins boats approach the shore at Maravelis, out in the bay, an air bombardment is softening up nearby Corregidor. Seizure of Maravelis will silence the harbor guns covering Corregidor. The LSTs unload at various points along the harbor's length. Beach conditions in several places hamper the bringing in of heavy equipment, but the troops quickly seize the Maravelis airstrip and begin fanning out to the north, east, and west. Preliminary softening up bombardment completely demolished Maravelis. Remaining Japs are cleaned out by troops of the 3rd Battalion. Raising the first American flag in Maravelis in almost three years. General MacArthur, driving down the east coast of Bataan on his way to Maravelis, stops to look at the remains of a roadblock and the Jap soldiers who manned it. Dawn. 
dawn, 16th February. Accompanied by Higgins boats filled with troops who landed at Maravillas, a convoy assembles off Bataan and starts across the bay toward Corregidor. Continuing the heavy air attacks that have rocked the island fortress daily for more than two weeks, liberators strike at sunrise. Attack bombers follow. For about an hour, they sweep the plateau at the western end of the island where the Japanese are believed to be dug in in the ravines and caves. While the convoy remains at a safe distance, the destroyers and cruisers move in to join the air attack with a heavy bombardment. In the meantime, at Elmore Strip on Mindoro, jump veterans of the 503rd Paratroop Infantry Regiment are briefed for the landing on Corregidor. Despite the small area of the target, two separate fields are selected for dropping the troops. The paratroopers get ready to move out. Veterans of the Markham Valley, New Guinea at NIRM-4 Airborne Operations, the men check their equipment in preparation for landing on the smallest jump field ever used for paratroops. Jumping altitude is to be five to six hundred feet. Takeoff for the mission is at 0715. The target run is an hour away. Air Force films show members of the 3rd Battalion receiving final instructions before making the initial jump. Corregidor is sighted without encountering aerial interception and the signal is given to prepare for leaving the plane. Two flights of C-47s head due north toward the island as they approach their targets on the first run. The planes arrive at 0830. The naval and air bombardment that began at dawn is continuing. A flight of A-20 sweeps in ahead of the transports to strafe ground installations and enemy personnel. Transports come down as low as 500 feet for the jump. Because of the small targets, only eight men at a time are dropped on each of the three runs. and the parade grounds on the rocky plateau known as Topside. The landing fields are next to the sites of our barracks and headquarters buildings destroyed during the siege in 1942. Troopers are dropped short of their targets and go over the cliffs. They climb down to the beaches where they're picked up by PT boats. Objective of the landing is to secure the plateau as one arm of a combined air and amphibious operation. consists of 2,500 paratroopers.
As the men land and get rid of their chutes, they form into units, each pushing out in a different direction toward the plateau's perimeter. Machine gun fire greeted some of the jumps, and a number of the troops are hit. Medical Corps men go to work on them. Despite the small area of the targets, a full 80% of the shoots hit the assigned spots. A counterattack is expected, and preparations are made to meet it. The intense air and naval bombardment has apparently stunned the Japanese, and no immediate assault develops. By 0900, the 51 transports complete all three runs. Machine guns and other equipment are moved into position to cover the amphibious invasion, and patrols advance to scout the topside plateau. While the paratroopers land on topside and push toward its perimeter, the air and naval bombardment continues to soften the island for a landing from the sea. After the paratroop landing, troops of the 3rd Battalion, 34th Infantry, begin moving in toward San Jose Beach. The beach is near bottom side, the wrecked dock area on the flat eastern section of the island. Jap emplacements flank the beach from the hills. In spite of the heavy pre-landing barrage, mortar, machine gun, and small arms fire meet the men as they hit the shore. The objective is to push across the 500-yard wide neck of the island and make contact with the paratroopers on the plateau. The beach is heavily mined, and most of the first vehicles to land are damaged. Jap machine gun nest hidden in a cave behind an old refrigerator plant. A 50 caliber machine gun and a tank 75 finally knock it out. By early afternoon, the 3rd Battalion moves forward to establish contact with the paratroopers.